What's up, everybody? I'm the Hook. And I'm the Blade. And together we're, you know. Welcome to the Broke Blade Gamecast, a show about <laughs> all things Assassin's Creed. I'm your host, Lawson. With me, as always, is your host, Timmy Turner. <laughs> What's fivin'? The standard Ottoman book blade has two parts. Oh my god, dude. Have you played have you played Assassin's Creed Valhalla? <laughs> I have. <laughs> have you pl- have you heard of uh it's this cool new uh Viking game. You get to like fight some witches and And you get to be like a Viking. So last week we did our first impressions. This week, I mean we wanted to do like a full review. We wanted to go in depth, talk about everything, story. All that, all that good shit. But uh, well, Tim, you're you're what halfway through the story? How far are you in? You think? Uh, uh, pro- uh, probably around there. I uh, I'm closing in on fifty hours. So I was at nine yeah. hours the last episode. So I've been playing quite a bit every chance I get. So yeah, yeah, you're pretty much where I was last episode. That that yeah, that seems about right. Yeah, I'm at I'm at almost a hundred hours. Um, and as you know, Timothy. <laughs> My game is broken now, yeah. <laughs> so I can't even finish <laughs> the ending, which has been pretty much. You were gonna finish it last night. Pretty, I was literally. My, I was. I went to bed excited before yesterday. <laughs> like tomorrow, I'm gonna finish Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I'm gonna know what happens in the ending, the uh. present day. I'm gonna get all of that. I've heard a couple of spoilers, um, most of which, unfortunately, after my game broke, and. Uh, I'm 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 excited to play the ending, but that excitement is certainly hampered now that I cannot do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty miserable. Um, I got to one of the later quests, not not quite at the directly the end of the game, though it's definitely like in the final arc or two, and uh, at a pretty pivotal moment, I'm not able to progress. There's a cutscene that's supposed to play that isn't playing, and I'm basically locked in a room. With no way out and no way to continue. I've tried pretty much every single common sense troubleshooting step that you could possibly do. I've reloaded earlier saves, restarted the console. I've uninstalled the game and reinstalled it. I've moved my save to another platform entirely with (laughs) Ubisoft Connect and tried there and still no luck. And because this comes so late in the story and Ubisoft, according to their known issues list, isn't even aware of this problem. They have about 12 or 13 quests that are bugged out for some users. And this one is not on the list. Right. So I've sent reports to every venue that I have any access to on their forums, uh, subreddits, Twitter, DMS, actual support contact. I've done as much as I can. Uh, it's in God's hands. Now it's yeah. in Odin's hands. Now, you know, Part Odin, of it, help me. <laughs> part of it is probably because no one on the fucking planet besides you and some other mods are even at that point in the game. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and like they've just they made a big deal. They they celebrated on all of their Twitter accounts. We just pushed a hot fix for the broken quest that's in the first arc of the game. And I get it; it's in the first arc, so those players aren't getting to to do anything. But but those players who maybe like five hours into the game, look. I, if if all I had to do right now was replay five hours, I would probably do it. That's how yeah. much a simp I am for Assassin's right. Creed. I would replay five hours. I will not replay a hundred <laughs> hours. Oh my god! No, are you kidding no. me? I wouldn't either. We're hopefully either either it gets patched before next week, or I will have to watch it all on YouTube, or or we'll do a little. We'll do a little work around. I'll, I'll borrow the keys to Tim's Stadia account and I'll <laughs> peek into the ending or something. We'll figure it out. I'm just really upset. The reason I bring this up is not to to vent, which I mean, it's a little bit to vent, but I've also vented plenty. Uh, thank you to the subreddit mods who have been there for me as moral support during this <laughs> this troubling time. I've probably I think I think I've complained enough to the point that now they're in that that chat. They're like, OK, Lawson, we get it. <laughs> Your game's broken. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm saying this because I, I I want you to know, dear listener, as you're as you're experiencing this podcast episode that like I'm a little upset with the game in general. and I'm going to try not to to let it cloud 
my thoughts on other things. I think I have the mental capacity to do that. So we're just going to move on now. Right. Tim, you're 50 hours in. We got a lot of, of your thoughts at the nine hour mark of what you were thinking about the game. So I guess a good place to start would be have your thoughts on, on some of the claims you made, the opinions you had last week. Has any of that changed significantly for better or worse? I'm glad you asked because there was one thing that I did want to address that has changed for the better. In terms of the like exploration and random collectibles that you come upon and, and the way in which you get them and some of the world events, I, I have come around a little bit on that. There was something that just turned me off from them first for those first nine hours, but I'm actually now finding that that's the most fun I can have in this game is just going and getting random gear and collectibles and whatnot. So I have come around on that. I totally see what you're saying now about the like, like you know, shooting an arrow and knocking down a, a you know, a pulley of, of, of things yeah. and knocking down a ladder and stuff. And something I, I wanted to mention to you is I totally don't think that that kind of like handcrafted like little environmental puzzles for collectibles needs to be exclusively to Valhalla. I, if anything, no. if anything about this game can survive uh, future games, I think it's that that kind of handcrafted experience. And I got to say, like, if we do get a game that is more parkour forward, I could totally see like, oh, you shoot this beam and so that it comes down to where you can you can run across it and stuff like they could mix these. Oh, yeah. I, I could see this in a game like Unity where you shoot the phantom blade and knock a ladder down or, you know, whatever. But totally. So that's the thing I've come around most to. And it's actually the thing that I hope survives this this game the most is because they could totally do this in like a more urban setting. Hundred percent. 100% agreed. And I think that I want that. And I also want the the sort of level to which they really nail, you know, the emergent storytelling in, in that context as well. Reading letters in almost every building you go into that reference things that happen in other world events and other quests. And just generally, I mean, that's been one of my biggest enjoyments with the game, though. I will now actually, because you've given that caveat, I'm going to caveat something that I said last week. Uh, for the worse, because I talked a lot about the quest, which early game now I'm going to say was was Grant Bridgeshire, which is the quest where you have to investigate those three people and see which one is the traitor. Right. I loved that quest. It was amazing. And I think that it set standards for the rest of the game that it hasn't really been able to live up to because I am now towards the end of the story. I have not seen anything that did quite what that quest did. Right. Yeah, there there are sometimes environmental clues and, and things that will tell you the insights of, of characters, but using the environment and using the, the details within it baked into the world to to answer a question or solve a mystery is, is not something that really happens. And, and even when the game does that kind of story later, there are, there are plenty of quests where you have to evaluate how trustworthy someone is. Right. They're all cordoning you off into these investigation areas that are tied to the story, just like Odyssey would do. And they're not just setting you loose in a world, letting you do quests right. within it and explore to find those answers. So eh, I got to dock them some points. I, yeah. I really wish they would have done committed to that experience. And I hope that now that they've seen how well it worked that like they, they'll know in the future on, on, on future games that they can really that they can nail that. And I have to give a shout out to, um, on Twitter, there was a woman talking about, she wrote that, that whole quest arc. She developed it basically. And so I want to, I want to send some appreciation her way. Cause you know, we talk about how cool Darby is every week. Right. <laughs> and Darby didn't write this quest. It was written by, I'm looking Olivia Alexander. Thank you, Olivia Alexander. You did a great job on that quest. I loved it. It's probably the best one. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Olivia. Yeah, I got to say, um, that kind of scene, that kind of felt like the natural evolution of what murder mysteries could have been. Yeah. Not so much just like, hey, here's a square of investigation things. Go press go press a button on them and that, and, and that be it. Yeah. I will say, though, my even while I was doing it, I wasn't too stoked about it because I don't know. I just kind of, I, I didn't feel like the lasting repercussions of whatever I chose really mattered. Like if I chose incorrectly. I, I believe I chose correctly. Um, 
I, I want to know what happens when you choose incorrectly. Maybe uh, Dylan can let us know. I think he tweeted, uh, Tarul, a.k.a. Dylan, can let us know. <laughs> he tweeted something about how he made the wrong choice. So I want to well, know what I, happened okay, Well, so I can't, I can't quite comment on that, I guess, because I made the wrong choice, and then I looked it up, yeah. and, I, and I reverted my save. So the, oh. what, I, what I do know is that yeah. the, the initial cutscene plays out exactly the same, yeah. but I don't know what the end of the arc is does differently because i do know that as a reward for getting the right choice you, you you get a gift i don't know if maybe you just don't get the gift if you choose the wrong option and stay and, 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 and stick with it i don't know what i liked about the 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 whole thing is that as a as a mystery it worked really well in that it gave you a clue right. that really seemed to indicate one guy but then if you probed any deeper and you checked out all of the clues that you could you could figure out that it kind of didn't make sense for it to be that guy. And that's like really good writing, actually. There's also something, though, is like I've noticed with with those types of like, who's the traitor? Who's the you know, who's the rat? Whatever type quest in these games. Like, for instance, when you're talking to Soma and you're like, hey, I, I'm suspecting it's this person. She kind of nudges you in the right direction. She's like, yeah, he has no reason to do that. So while I give it credit, like if, if, if you said to Soma, I suspect it's this person. Ha, whoever Soma kind of agrees with your assessment the most, then that's pretty much who did it. I mean, maybe you're right about that particular instance, but I feel like that's just as likely to be a red herring as anything else. If Soma agrees with, oh, it's this person. In this case, sure, it turned out that that was right. the right person. But when I played, I thought, well, she's leading me that way, which means it maybe isn't that guy. So... I do have to give credit. Usually in these murder mystery contexts, when when it's treated as actual gameplay and not as a storytelling device, which is an important distinction, right? Because obviously Unity and Syndicate had murder mysteries, and that was gameplay. You had to actually figure out who the bad guy was. Sometimes it was really easy. Sometimes it was kind of hard. In uh, Origins and Odyssey, there are investigation areas all over the place, but you're never actually thinking about anything. It's just a way to interact with objects and construct a story in your right. mind of what happened here that they tell you what it is. And it's purely like it's like an interactive cutscene. Basically, you just look for the thing, interact with it. It tells you what happened. This game has plenty of those, especially later on. But the whole Grant Bridge Shire arc was different in the sense that it wasn't a cordoned off area. The clues were already in the world and you actually had to think to figure out who it right. was. That's that's gameplay, right? It's not just moving the story along. And uh, uh, props props to them. I was going somewhere with that, and I completely forgot what it was. You were telling me, yeah, okay. I was going to say that, like, usually there's something that tells you exactly who did it. There's a clue that confirms it, and the only gameplay is just finding that clue and recognizing what it means. I didn't feel like that was the case with this, which is why I give it some props. Right. But we can talk about other things now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, I do agree with you. I would have liked to see that pop up more because the rest of them are, aren't nearly as open-ended as that one. I've still had a couple of arcs where there were some genuinely interesting choices. But, and I guess it's probably time to talk about that now. The choices mechanic in this game, and I know this is bordering on story, but I, I think I consider it gameplay. And I don't think the ending of the game will change my opinion on this much. The choices pretty much don't matter. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> nope. This is not a choice-driven game, contrary to what has been said about it. I and, and look, I played Odyssey, and you know I've said many times, Odyssey, it's genuinely pretty choice-driven. There are a lot of important choices you can right. make that have repercussions that are easily visible. I hate the way it handles the ending and how the choices determine the ending, but this game, which I'm sure is going to have a similar sort of thing where you'll have a good ending, bad ending, what have you, still it feels like the choices don't make much of a difference outside of their respective arcs. I've never had really strong repercussions for a choice that made me feel bad about making it. Right. I've never had... And, and obviously, as we've noticed... The dialogue is full of choices that are completely redundant. They are completely useless. I, I've ran out of fingers on my hands to count how many times it happens. I will say one thing, and then uh, I'll say it, and then awkwardly, Eivor says the thing that they really wanted you to say, <laughs> and it, the conversation completely goes in that direction. Like, what the fuck? What was the point? Why let me choose? Why? Like, Eivor says plenty of things that I don't choose to say. I understand that they every now and then need to pop up a, a little dialogue choice, but 
if Avor is just going to take the conversation in the other direction anyway, sometimes they com- are completely contradictory. I could say one thing and then Avor yeah. says the complete opposite right after. And and there's also the fact that there are a number of moments in the story that I want to choose something different, but I'm not given the ability yes. to choose. Yeah. yeah. It's, which makes you really feel like, am, okay, am I actually controlling this yeah. character or 100%. only when the game wants me to? 100%. Be? It, it's frustrating because they choose what you say anyway when you make a choice but when you really do want to make a choice it's like yeah no actually you're not allowed <laughs> right and then and then beyond that sometimes i'll make choices that i would think would have a huge consequence and i'll make them knowing that there will be a consequence and then no consequence happens and then i just feel like well what the what the hell was that all about anyway, right really at the end of the day the choice mechanic of this game feels completely unnecessary. I don't think I've seen plus, um, you know, I've made choices that should have been, should have been disastrous, should have been terrible. hundred percent. I've made choices that should have killed people and everything turns out fine. Sometimes in the most ridiculous ways possible. Well, and you've said before, you know, just don't half ass the choice element. Like if you're going to do it, do it. Yeah. Don't pretend it's more than it is. You know, like the preference is no choices. But if you're going to do it, like this is objectively worse than both options. Either this is is worse than no choice at all or full 100 percent like diverging path RPG game level of choices. Like I can't help but think that if Darby just went full send into that, then we'd be getting a better experience overall. Not this in between like half assed. Sometimes, like literally, legitimately, I feel like my choices don't matter so much that I start making the really obnoxious, like ridiculous choices because I know nothing's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, I think the game's length counts against it in this regard, too. If you're making a game that takes 50 to 60 hours, if you're rushing through the story, that's somewhere close to the estimate given on how long to beat dot com, making it by far the longest Assassin's Creed game in history. Um, If that's the game that you're going to make. If it's going to be that long, obviously your resources to have really strong branching paths where certain characters weave in and out of the narrative based on your choices, it's just not feasible. Right. I agree with you. That's a pretty strong art. I mean, if you want to sell your game on the presence of dialogue options, maybe make a game that actually uses them effectively and and in a quality way that enhances the experience. Yeah. Like every time they talked about, well, we built this game around choices. It's an inherent and important part of the story. I can't buy that for a second anymore. I think that it was something that Ubisoft imposed on the development team that they did maybe the best they could, but it just, you can tell that the game they want to make is actually clashing with the mechanic of, of dialogue options completely. It just feels like we're not getting the best version of these events when we have this completely arbitrary, redundant choice based off of it. Ultimately, like, yeah, I don't want choices in these games, but I can't enjoy it as like your typical choice based RPG game. It won't let me do that because they're so yeah limited in surface level choices anyway. So now I'm in this I, I, we're in this in between where it's not really enjoyable as, a, as your typical Assassin's Creed story. And it's not really enjoyable as like an RPG, you know, diverging path game. Yep. I, I think that pretty much sums it up. I feel like because of that as well. There really aren't much stakes when it comes to the alliance map. Um, allying with one person does <laughs> allying with one person doesn't neglect another. There's no utilization of your allies either. You know that whatever random part of the story, I'm going to call upon those people because of course I'm going to call upon those people because I had no other choice. It's not like I was picking between two different places. Yeah. I feel like it, it actually would have been a a choice on my part if I if I had to choose between two different regions with both having their own pros and cons. But instead of that, and and that would also give people a completely unique experience. Like, oh, well, I went with East Angula instead of Lincolnshire or vice versa. Yeah. You're kind of just going down this path that they set for you and it gives you the illusion of choice. Like, and not even that effectively. Like if the most I can do is choose the order in which I play memory sequences, you know, that syndicate did that. It's very, you know, yeah, like it's fine. Only even if it actually worked, I know it hasn't happened to me personally, but I've heard of people who got spoiled um, on what happens in other arcs because they chose an arc right. that by whatever metric you should have done in a different order, even though it gave you access to all three at a certain point. So like, can't give them credit for that. They talked about it in the, in the advertising, like 
this idea that you would have to make alliances intentionally based on certain gameplay factors, but the alliances is not a gameplay mechanic. It just is not. It is no, a storytelling even, device no, yeah. that's leading you from place to place, which let me, let me, <laughs> let me hit you with a hot take real quick. Go for it. That's very much in line with what you're saying. Are you ready for a, a scorching hot the, take? Yeah, let's go. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm so ready. I'm, I'm yeah. so ready. Okay. Cool. 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 You know how they said that in this game, there is no side content. Everything is main content. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I would like to pose the thought that there is no main content in this game. <laughs> there is only side content. <laughs> <laughs> because think about like there. Okay. There were side quest storylines in Odyssey that were just as deep and meaningful in their storytelling, you know, approach as any given arc of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. There are a couple of main plot threads that weave in and out, probably adding up to like two or three actual arcs of the story, having any bearing on anything like that. The rest just feels like side missions. It feels like side quests. I, I, I don't know how else to put it. The whole episodic structure that they went for, I'm, I'm a huge fan of in theory, but in practice and execution, the way that they did it, I felt like nothing I was doing was actually moving the story forward. Yeah. If I care about, you know, the, the, the hidden one storyline, or I care about the Sigurd storyline or X, Y, Z storyline that's, that's in there, I'm going to have to get through a lot of random other guff to see what happens next in that story. Yeah. It's, it's just, I really think it, it's just a weird way to pace a story too. I feel like I can't ever keep momentum because, Oh, there's been a development actually in the story. Now, I'm going to have to go and pledge my allegiance to do to, to two different regions and go fuck off and do things there before I can see the, you know, the outcome of this. And so that means yeah. like everything that's actually like impactful, it like gets, gets put on the back burner for a little while. It's really hard to keep momentum up for a, you know, like a, a quote main story that lasts that long. Yeah. And it's just like when there are so many arcs, as I believe there are that you could just cut out of the game and not really lose anything of, of substance. It's like, it's like, a, it's like I'm listening to an album with a hundred songs on it. Of course they're not all winners. Some of them are like bottle episodes. Like some of them, I don't yeah, feel like I've, most of them are bottle episodes. I guess we're kind of getting the story talk here, but yeah, I, I just yeah, don't feel like we got to be careful. I mean, let's just say like, this is mostly, I mean, yeah, this is a mild spoiler episode. It's part one of our review, you know, next time we'll get into more story concrete, but, but we can, I guess, talk delicately about some of these things now. Like Walking Dead, uh, the Telltale version, like that's infamous for giving you the illusion of choice. But at the very least, if you choose something to say as, as, as Lee, like he'll say it Yeah. <laughs> within and, and, and like, you can just choose to be quiet in that game and you're just. You just don't you just don't say anything. You abstain from responding. And characters from can fluctuate between loving you and hating you within one conversation. Like I, I feel like with this game, it, it straps you down and it's like, oh hey, you like Stowe, don't you? Well, no matter what the fuck happens, he's coming back in a later arc. So have fun with that. You know, and it's like it takes all yeah. the agency out of me. It takes all you know, like And like Illusion of choice is fine if it's getting the emotional response that that the game wants you to have. Like I'm okay with there being choices that are not really choices. I recognize that that's part of the it's part of the job. That's what you have to do in order to to make me feel like my choices matter. Not all of my choices necessarily can matter. Right. But when it's so transparent as it is in this game and it's so easy to figure out that like Hey, my, my choices aren't really going to mean much. Obviously that's, that's defeating the yeah. whole purpose. I'm not coming away from this experience feeling like my decisions as Eivor really shaped the face of England and really gave me an experience that is substantially different from the one that every single other player is having. I remember when, when we first got that UB4 thing, Darby was talking about how that quest can end in so many different ways and it really can't. There's maybe two options, nope. maybe, you know, like yeah. I feel like they were kind of overselling on that aspect because it's very restrained, but to the point where it's frustrating because 
why am I going to bother participating in this conversation if Avor is just going to say what I don't want them to say anyway? So, so Timothy, <laughs> we talked last week about raids. I had some pretty strong opinions about them. Uh, my feelings haven't changed significantly, but I've also stopped doing a lot of the raids right. because I started actually wanting to finish the game, uh, which, you know, just shows me, I guess. Um, have your feelings about raids changed at all? Uh, not really. Not really for the better. I kind of begrudgingly do them. Sometimes if I, like, there's actually one one raid that I actually thought was in a unique location, and so I, I actually had a decent time doing it. But I guess my biggest complaint about the raids, and, and this also comes into the assaults too, I think there's, it's just kind of strange to me how there's no quantifiable way that, like, how your side is doing. Hmm. There's nothing stopping me from just, uh, uh, staying with my crew and helping them in battle or going and taking out archers and stuff because all it's all completely reliant on me getting the loot and leaving. So there's nothing stopping yeah. me from just focusing on that. And so a lot of the times I find myself, in a, in a, and especially in the assaults, I am just running to the next objective. Yep. I'm not stopping to help my, my, my crew. Also, I think what, what would have been a fine fix to this is just to put a bar at the top of your screen and have one side your <laughs> side and one side is the other and it's like a struggle. And so the more things that you do, yeah. you can cuz so now you have a tangible way to see that your side is doing better because otherwise there's nothing motivating me to stop and fight with them. I just run past it all because they're going to battle forever anyway. Um so that's that's very apparent in raids. I also think this speaks to another issue I have with the raids and, and the assault and settlement in general. Like you have no idea how how big your 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 force is. You have you ha you know how big your settlement is, but you don't yeah. know how how many people are there, how many fighters you have, how many warriors you have. And so, how about how about if I free prisoners while I'm doing a raid, they come home with me. Like Black Flag did this very simply by giving you a crew bar. Yeah, you just had a, a meter yeah. of crew members, and and, it, and that was fine. Like you lost some in those battles, yeah. but you and you and you would also you and you would regroup some after you plundered a ship. And so it'd be nice if I yeah. got a little screen after a raid that said, "Hey, you've won over ten crew members. Good for you." And like, and then that gives you an advantage in your next yeah, raid. Yeah, you're exactly. You're completely, it would give you. You're painfully right. That's exactly what I'm getting at. Is you've never been more right about anything else in your that's, life. That's what I'm getting. Like I swear to God. If it, like yeah, I was so positive about the raids and the sieges last week. Not well, I wasn't positive about the raids, but I was positive about the sieges. I was like, well, have you done the siege? It's really <laughs> fun. And I wish I could go back in time by a week and shoot myself in the head <laughs> because I was completely wrong. Because I did realize pretty quickly after making that statement that like. Even if no matter how interactive you think the siege is, it isn't actually making a difference because it's going to play out the same way. And there are plenty of times where it's like, hey, do you want to weaken their forces a little bit before you go? No, I actually don't want to because it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter. <laughs> you know what would be lovely is if as soon as I start the siege and I actually did the, the side quest to weaken their forces, I, I can see a tangible way that my efforts were, were paid off. It would. It's a great opportunity to revive a sort of central idea of the Assassin's Creed games in a very different context. Right. Because as we saw in AC1, AC Unity, the idea of gathering information to give you an advantage on an assassination mission was a core part of the experience. And now that assassination missions pretty much don't matter, uh, but sieges and raids, these are things that like they're they've in this game, they've taken the place of an assassination as the end point of an arc as the thing you're building up to. So what if I could gather information that would actually make that tangibly? Yes easier or tangibly more satisfying. What if the siege was the black box and yeah. I could scout with my Eagle, find opportunities to change the tide of battle, but they don't give you a frame of reference for who's winning the battle because it doesn't matter. It's not, it's not gameplay. It's right. purely story. And, it's just not. And gameplay. you would, you would be incentivized to build up your, your, your crew more because when you yeah. go into battle or I could go, wow, I look at this, I look at this raid I want to do or this siege this next in the story. And I don't have enough, you know, the forces or weapons like, you know, oh, I need to upgrade my battering ram so that I can do right. this siege. And then I do it and I feel like I've accomplished and unlocked and earned something. And it's strange because like the jackdaw, I feel like represented a lot of that. Like you're going to upgrade your ship to take on bigger ships. So why can't you upgrade your 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 Viking force long ship to take on to do better to raids. take on bigger raids? And so why can't I bring like fucking three long ships to a raid? That would almost make that would almost make the Yums Viking mechanic make any goddamn sense, which it currently doesn't. 
Also, Lawson, speaking of the settlement, <laughs> why the fuck does the settlement not generate income for you? That seems like the biggest missed opportunity yeah. that, that for the settlement possible. I, I, I have stopped upgrading yeah. my settlement because what I, I, I don't get anything from it. I know that you can like call a feast and get a, a buff for a little bit, but if it was giving me silver... It would kind of give this game a a good economy, or giving you or giving you ingots like right. nickel, copper, titanium well, well, ingots. Yeah, well, that's the thing is, I was thinking like, okay, so you go to a raid, you get the raw materials and supplies to build up your settlement, and then after you build up your settlement, you start getting more silver or more ingots. So it has this yeah. natural organic flow, and it incentivizes you to do raids more. But at the moment, I only do raids if I want to build up my settlement to get nothing. It doesn't really. Yeah. It's not. It's not a very rewarding system in that in that way. It's it's pretty half baked, and I, I'm I'm only realize like fully realizing now in this conversation just how half baked the entire mechanic of the Viking experience is. Like, it's just it's a veneer. It's a facade. Yeah. It's an aesthetic. It's it's the look of of rolling up your your long ship to a, co- a coast and and sending them to go grab shit and. You just run around, you collect the things, you fight some people. It's like about as interactive or meaningful as like a conquest battle in Odyssey, which was about the lamest thing you could do. But even that gave you bars at the top to tell you how well you right. do it. Yeah. And and it's it's really just a it's really just a matter of like you go to a raid or an assault and it is the most selfish thing in the world because you are just running to the next objective. Like and they have some of these mechanics where like you destroy, you, you can sabotage the big crossbows that they can shoot you with and stuff. And that'd be nice is if every time that happened, your bar got a little bigger, you know, like, and I know, I, yeah. I, know, what I'm su- yeah. I know what I'm suggesting is a little like surface level, but that, that that's really all I need to be in the battle. Even if they did that, it would have boiled down to just like the conquest battles where you, you, you see those bars, but it doesn't matter because if you do go objective to objective, you are going to right. win. Like. Right there's no question. So there was really not a lot of thought or strategy going into those. And there probably wouldn't be here either, but it's like, yeah, if I could unlock a way to maybe get through a door faster or whatever. And and the way it would matter in the end is if that meant saving the lives of my crew and, and I'm not losing as many crew members, right. which I need to do more raids yeah, and sieges. Exactly. There's like really easy game design ways to make this work. Now I have to imagine that if we're thinking of these ideas, the developers probably thought of these ideas and either they decided they were not the best ideas for whatever reason, or they could not implement them in the time that they had. I don't really know what yeah. it is. If, if building up your, your Viking crew is going to, is going to, is going to allow you to be more successful with the assaults and allow you to be more successful with the raids and such, you're going to want to not lose as many of them as possible. And this was present in black flag. Whenever I lost a crew member, because I was, I wasn't, taking the ship fast enough, I was like, well, great. That sucks. Yeah, I felt and bad. It would be nice if because of the settlement mechanics, if some of the people that you took on with you, they were like your pals. And so you're going to be incentivized to protect them more. Yeah. And the yeah. better you can do at raids, there should, there, there should have been the system where the, the better you can do at raids, the better materials you can get, the better you can build up your settlement, the more money that you can make. So it, w- it would be a symbiotic relationship between you and the raiding mechanic. But It's really, yeah, like you said, it's just kind of a facade. It's really just you running into a place, just taking all the loot and leaving while a insubstantial battle happens around you. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. I, yeah, I don't get how it's as, as lame as it is. Um, and shame on Ubisoft for giving us such weak garbage. Just kidding. I'm not really, I don't feel that strongly about it, but it it is, it is a missed opportunity. I feel like with the whole Viking setup, they had the opportunity to, to give us the best of the homestead, the best of the assassin, uh, you know, management system and the best of the black flag ship RPG crew management all in one system. And instead we actually got none of that none of it whatsoever <laughs> we yeah. got nothing good it's just it's it's it might a raid might as well be a cutscene for as interactive as it actually is it's just that yeah, simple 100 percent. so other gameplay things that we can talk about how have your feelings changed in any way about the combat system in this game um i will say that like lately it's just gotten easier it's gotten a little easier yeah. um and so i'm not hating it as much just because it's easier, but just because it's easier doesn't mean it's any more fun, right? So I'm not having as much, yeah. I'm not having any more fun with it. I'm just 
I'm leveled up enough to not have to die every two seconds or whatever. Things are clicking more for sure. Um, And there are like flashes of a good combat system here. It's just, it's, it's, it's a total mess when you're fighting multiple people, you're just swinging your, your, your weapons and hoping you hit someone. Boss battles are not as fun as they probably think they are. (laughs) Oh my God, dude. Yeah, there are some fucking shitty boss fights. I'm going to say there's one. I won't uh, give any story details about it, but it's part of the mythological sequences. And it is quite possibly the worst experience I've had in an Assassin's Creed game since the Charles Lee chase (laughs) at the end of AC3. Think about that. (laughs) Think about that. You've played that recently. You know how much of a shit show it is. And genuinely, in 2020, the year of our Lord, we got a boss fight in an Assassin's Creed game that is so painfully bad, might actually be worse than the Charles Lee chase. I mean that completely sincerely. (laughs) It made me actually want to die. Not because it was hard, not because it was frustrating, but because it was long. So, so painfully long that it really made me feel like Like at that point, I'm just insulted. Like, does the game have any respect for my time whatsoever? If I'm going to put the the time into this game that it's demanding, I put in and I'm going to have to spend 30 minutes of that on a goddamn boss fight where you just chip away pixel by pixel with each hit on a health bar of an enemy who can clear half of your health in the same in one hit, like just insulting, just seriously, genuinely (laughs) insulting. You know, it is. Fuck you, Assassin's Creed it, Valhalla. It coming or, like, speaking of the combat, like there, it is very ironic that the most fun I have in this game is gathering new gear and gathering, you know, different, uh, you know, wealth and collectibles and whatever. And so I get a new piece of gear. And I'm like, oh, that was awesome. That was rewarding. That was fun. But then I'm like, oh, well, now I got to use it in the combat system. <laughs> if the combat, if the combat was more rewarding. It's a great point. Then I, I, it would be even better when I got a new piece of gear because getting it was enjoyable and rewarding and now using it in combat is more enjoyable and rewarding. And I just, the combat system is not there for me. Uh, People know what I prefer in AC combat. This is one of the worst ones probably (laughs) at the end of the day. I just, I, I I know I said this last week, but I want to double down that like, I get that this combat for a lot of people is fun. I get that it's a little bit more modern. It's a little bit more in, in depth. It's, it's, it's a, it's a deeper system than, than Assassin's Creed combat usually had before this trilogy. There is some worth to that, but conceptually the way it works, I just don't like how unrealistic it is. That's a personal taste thing. It's not a quality thing other than having really long damage sponge boss fights, which I think is an objectively shitty thing. My opinion on the combat is entirely personal to me. I just like cinematic, actiony, you know, like realistic combat. Like I AC1. Feel like there are stakes to a battle. Yeah, honestly, yeah, <laughs> sure. AC one combat is fine. It's better than this, <laughs> obviously. I don't think it's better than like you know Revelations combat even, but it's good. It's fine. But yeah, it's just like. If I'm had the, if I've had this realistic, serious Viking adventure where I've just made a serious choice, it's now putting me in an armed combat against somebody I care about. And then all of a sudden we're like jumping into the sky, <laughs> doing fucking Bayonetta fighting moves. No. Yeah. It's and so, like, yeah, you're so right. Drinking poisons and throwing fireballs at each other. It's like, okay, is this a realistic Viking adventure? Is this a grounded cinematic experience? You know, where I can stack stones and, you know, think peacefully about my memories right. of childhood. Or is this a game that I would play at a fucking Chuck E. Cheese? <laughs> what is it? What is this game? That's how I feel. About yeah. It. It, yeah. It's the boss fights in the combat in general is, is kind of the complete opposite of the tone that they are trying to go for in certain parts of the game too. Yeah, for sure. Like uh, it's a little difficult to imagine them having a conversation with this person as we are flying through the air and falling down mountains. And <laughs> it's not, it's not that yeah. ridiculous, but it it's close. It's no. close. It's close. It does kind of make me think of something though. Here's let me let me hit you with a positive. I've been pretty negative this episode. Let me let me give you a little positive. And I was gonna I wanted your opinion on this too. Okay. I think world events are better than side quests as they existed in Origins and Odyssey by quite a bit. I like that they're usually really short. They are not there to justify a gameplay experience. They're there to just 
tell you a goofy little quick story that you interact with very slightly and then move on. I, I, I find it to be a good system for what quests and, and side and world events, how they can expand the world, how they can give you more information about things. Even if a lot of them are honestly sillier than I think this game really should have that said again, like side quests in Odyssey, they're there to make you go do a thing. It's always fetch quests. It's always go to this fort and get my friend, brother, person, and then you're just clearing forts, just like you're doing in the main story, just like you're doing if you're running around collecting stuff. It's all clearing forts. I can run up to a guy in a world event, and he can say some dumb shit to me, and we have a brief conversation, and then maybe I do a little environmental puzzle. I make a, a tiny, meaningless choice, and you know I'm, I'm well on my way. There have been some really good and interesting ones, a lot of really silly ones, but again, I just have to say, like, that's another thing I would not mind seeing again in a future installment, that sort of framework for having a world event rather than a side quest. I, I think this is probably what like Paris stories wanted to be like this. Like, yeah, there is something about how emergent it is, because I let's say I'm going towards a yellow dot. I'm trying to get some wealth. I see a world event that's right here. And, and I like you said, I know that it's not going to be an hour long thing. So I just I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah, let me, let me try it. Let me do it. Some of them incredibly silly, really stupid, actually. Yeah. Um, I, 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 well, I don't want to say stupid. Like they're just really goofy and silly. And, and they're another kind of betrayal of the tone that can be achieved sometimes of riding through this countryside. It's all moody, which is interesting. Cause I feel like they're very in line with what the tone is of Assassin's Creed in general. It's always been kind of tongue in cheek and I think it's okay, but there's definitely, yeah, some extent to which this game specifically in this main story doesn't quite fit. Well, yeah, for sure. And there are some that are great and actually have like pretty meaningful little, little stories attached to them. Some of them are, are ridiculous. And that's, and that's where I think it's the problem lies the most is I'm not apprehensive of starting one because I think it's going to take long. I'm apprehensive of doing one because it might be stupid. And <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I'll hear the, the beginning dialogue of some of them. and I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing it. But some of them, I hear yeah. like a little girl shouting for her father and I go down, you know, and like, then I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this one. Cause this one actually will probably be, um, yeah. And so. I do think that this is where like side quests for AC could end up st sticking with. It's also nice too that like if I don't want to do a world event, I know that we say that it, it would like Ubisoft should be able to allow us to not experience something, but it is it is also kind of nice that I can see a world event and even walk past it and then come back later to do it another time. The first time I did one, I was just shocked, like actually shocked that there wasn't like a quest marker to follow, that there wasn't like an entry yeah, in my quest for log, sure. and that now it was going to weigh on me for the rest of the game until I finished the side quest. That's amazing that they were able to, to make it work the way that they did. They're buggy as hell. I've had like four or five ones that are just so broken. I cannot complete them. And that's not fun because when you give us a game that the appeal of it is to get all of the things and, and max out these bars that you're showing us on every territory. Like I want to, I want a little check mark next to the wealth bar, the mysteries bar. Right. And then I can't do it because half the fucking quests are completely unbeatable. That sucks. Doesn't suck as bad as not being able to finish the main story, which is now my new barometer for how shitty right. something can be in an Assassin's Creed. Mm -hmm. But that, that is that. There is something I wanted to mention, too, about the world events, um, is it would be cool if there are certain world events, like, and this would tie back into how I would like the settlement to actually function. It would be nice if in a world event, if I, like, find someone, and I'm like, all right, just come back to my settlement with me, and then my settlement has grown now, and I have, like, like you know what I mean? Like, not, I, I wish it would grow more than just the buildings that I would build, but, also like, it would be neat if, some of these world events could end in me recruiting these people, then there's even more reason for me to do them, you know? Yeah. Like there are some people who I could totally just invite back with me and they could, and then, and then they could unlock something for me at the settlement that I wouldn't have had otherwise. That would make a really unique experience. Like, Oh shoot, I missed that world event. And so I didn't get that thing that you got in your settlement. That would have been neat. Yeah. But yes, I do like, they are emergent. They're not super long. So I can, I know I can do one and not be, um, committing myself to an hour long side quest or whatever. Yeah. 
Yeah, they're they're quality wise all over the place, and there are probably a lot more of them than they really need. I think when you start to recognize tropes of common things that'll just happen across the world events, like every other one of them is going to involve someone who's like a little bit crazy and thinks they're seeing shit they're not seeing. But there are also so many main story arcs, you start to recognize the tropes within those and that, that you start to feel like you're seeing some of the same characters over and over again. I played a couple arcs pretty close to each other that my mom was kind of in the room while I was, I was playing. My, my mom was like around the living room. She was observing. She was like, you know, commenting on, on story events and stuff. And like, I'm just going to say these names. So this isn't a spoiler if you haven't gotten to either of these characters. Um, but if you have, you'll know what I'm talking about. Like she spent a good significant portion of time thinking Chailbert and Oswald were the same dude. Because effectively, I mean, yeah, they dude, are. Yeah, hundred percent. So yeah, world events could be better. I like what they're going for though, and I and that is another thing that I would be open to to sticking around. Um, it just sucks that, and 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 sometimes that kind of adds to the innocence and beauty of some of them. Is like they don't always give you something in return. But it would be yeah. neat if if some of them some did. of them some yeah some of them would turn into like oh come back with my settlement with me and whatnot. Yeah, or what if a, a a world event led you to a main quest that you otherwise wouldn't have access to? Wouldn't that be interesting? Yeah. That'd be oh, the yeah, closest for sure, for Ubisoft sure. would ever get to putting effort into something that they didn't think 100% of players would get to, but it would be possible. I do think that some of these world events could also be a little bit more rooted in like the Assassin Templar like universe. Some of them are just are just random citizens and whatnot. It would be cool if like, I came across a, a hidden one or something, you know, and like, yeah, well, okay. So I think that gets me to, I, I guess the sort of final point that I want to make is that if I were to make a list of all the things in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, mostly gameplay wise that I want to see come back in a future installment, it would pretty much be these things, the world event system, you know, maybe with better execution, I'd be okay with seeing the settlement again, something like the settlement the navigation, not really navigation, the environmental puzzles that exist in the world that you have to solve to get collectibles that actually make you think. And the, the fact that there's like a modern day story and uh, a lore and a connection to the series past that is mu much more substantial than any game in the last five years, giving us playable modern day, giving us, you know, codex pages, a, the truth style video. That's, that's really fucking cool. I really like that stuff. Those are the only things in Assassin's Creed Valhalla that I enjoyed so much on their own in a vacuum that I'd be like, yes, come back in 2021, 22, give us another Assassin's Creed game, and those things can stay. Everything else, the shitty parkour, the really floaty arcadey combat, the fact that stealth is not really super viable for most important parts of the game. I want to see all that thrown into a, a blender and then poured down a garbage disposal and then left in a dumpster and then shipped off to a landfill in Montreal. Like I just want it gone forever. No thanks. <laughs> there is something to like worth mentioning about how a lot of the arcs kind of end in this big assault and there's just no viable way to do stealth in any of those. It's just like, fuck you. You're doing combat now. <laughs> no. Yeah. And, and as I said last week that we were misled, that we were told that a lot of these things we would be able to stealth attack, assassinate them. Why can't I at least stealth attack a zealot? Why, why can't I sneak yeah. <laughs> up on a zealot and at least take away some of their unimaginably fucking huge health bars. There's no reason for it in the story or the world of the game. Why? Oh, these enemies, I just cannot hit the R one button and get any of their health down. It's just that the game wants me to spend an hour of my life chipping away at a stupid fucking health bar to get yeah. a, a memory corridor, which I appreciate that it's there, but most of the zealots, they're like total non sequiturs. Like nothing they're saying makes any sense. Well, yeah, yeah. well, I, I suppose it is worth mentioning too, is I've had more time with the ancients hierarchy thing. Still love it. Still great. That could totally stay around. Yeah, that can stay around too. I think especially if it were tied more closely into the main story of a game, but yes, 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 yes. And, and if they really leaned into more emergent, ways of bringing it into the fold. Ubisoft in general is getting better at doing these more systemic games. Watch Dogs Legion is probably the gold standard right now for creating emergent storytelling with a system. Like what if what if a world event led you to an order of the ancient that you have to kill? You know, yeah. like that like some of some of that like I, I think if they could interweave some of these things, like and if world events 
did have maybe more various outcomes sometimes. Um, I'm not saying I want them all to be like super duper important. Quests, no, and that's kind but, of what, what Odyssey did with its cultists is it, is it had you say, um, you know, well, for this one to get more clues, you have to go help the people in this region. And that always uh, boiled down yeah. to doing side quests. And that's kind of right, which is fine. I think that's okay to have some of them tied to side content, just like they would with world events. But I also think the more emergent they can get with it, the more like naturally those things can arise, the better. Sure. And and I'm not saying that like I want every world event to have to lead to an, an ancients or whatever. I just mean yeah. like if there was like maybe five of the thousand world events that like led me at least to a clue, that 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 would be cool. And you know what? At the end of the day, give me give me the exact same order of the ancient screen that currently exists in the exact same system, and then just title it Templars, and I'm already gonna be happier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is gonna make me happier. And I always like like coming across a, a clue in the open world, and I'm like, oh, cool, and you know, and like I am seeking it out sometimes. Yeah, I definitely, uh, as you said, I definitely want to see it more attached to the main story, like, and just like you know, like like I said last episode, I would if that was just the main story, and all of the uh, targets had little, you know, like every target was kind of like a sequence or whatever. Dope, cool, perfect, definitely, dude, definitely. In terms of, like, gameplay and whatnot, I've had the most, like, even though the movement system is awful, I've had the most enjoyment in Jorvik. I feel like that was that yeah, was built the Same. most for parkour. I told you, I, didn't I say to you that it, that I thought Jorvik was pretty good for parkour? I don't know. Uh, because, like, it feels like you can actually get from point A to point B just on rooftops and ropes for a lot of it. It's also, it's also just like built in a in a way that like looks inviting to climb on. So listen, listen up people, listeners of the show Hookblade. It's been fun talking about mostly gameplay stuff this week. Next week we are somehow by the grace of Odin going to finish the story and know what happens at the end of the story and we're going to see how that goes. Um and that's what we're going to be talking about next week on the Hookblade. If you enjoyed this episode, you know, if you're on YouTube, give us a like, give us a subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. Ring the bell so that you can find out about sexy, hot, new, attractive episodes in your inbox, subscription box every uh -huh. single week. And uh, if you're not on, on YouTube, if you're on Spotify, Apple Music, Podcast, Breaker, Overcast, Radio, Public, any of the bajillion podcast platforms, you can show us some love on Twitter. Follow us at Hookblade. Send us a tweet, a neat little tweet. You can send us a fleet. <laughs> I don't think you can send it to people, but fleets exist now. That's something that started today as we're recording this. That was fucking stupid. What the fuck is a fleet? Terrible idea. Stories rip off. You hate to see it. Um, other than that, you can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That really helps us a lot. We still just have one from Nick Barish. Thank you, Nick. You're very handsome. Mm. Thank Anyone you, who Nick. Leaves you us handsome an Apple devil. Review, we're going to call you handsome on the show. <laughs> Yeah, also leave in the comments what you guys are thinking about Valhalla gameplay. Do you like the combat system? If you do, don't comment. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know. Here's my question for you, commenters, comment, commentettes, commentresses. Tell us what are the things in Valhalla you want to see in the next game? They can be anything, things we talked about, things we haven't talked about. What are the elements of the design, the gameplay? The, the facets of the story that you're like, I want them to do more of this because I feel like we all need some positivity in this dark, dark world. I've been the hook. I've been the blade. And we will see you next week. Where's the Timster? Uh oh, I think I lost you. <laughs> That's not good. Hold on. Where'd he go? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm back. Sorry, I, I have no idea what happened. You've been gone for like the last two minutes. And then I, well, I'll, yeah, and I said, yeah, I said, I, 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 uh, I mean, I said it into the microphone, so, so you'll have it either way. <laughs>